Happy one afternoon, everyone. Welcome, very welcome to this uh, Linguist 60 Fundamental Seminar. Um, I shall say, bienvenue to, to Liam, um, who is from the, I guess the island might be second closest to my heart, <laughs> uh, which is Jersey. Um, and he's going to be talking to us um, about some work he's been doing um, on, I guess you could call it linguistic anthropology of, of Gerier. Um, I think this will be very interesting for those of us who are doing language documentation to have an anthropological insight in, into the kinds of things that we do. Um, Liam is a native of Jersey. Um, he um, learnt Jerry for what, about 10 years when you were at school? About 15, no. Yeah, I've, I've, I've 10, seen, 15, yes. I just saw a video of you recently when you were about 14. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, um, and yes, um, has mis uh, and is currently doing a degree in visual anthropology at Goldsmiths uh, University of London, uh, which is a hotbed of Channel Islands language activism. Um, there's, there, have been, there have been two others at least that I know of who have done uh, um, degrees on, on something to do with their language while, while there. Anyway, um, yeah, without further ado, welcome Liam. Hey guys. Um, so yeah, I'm sort of going to go through my presentation. It's not... I guess it's not as formal as, as a lot of others. It's sort of um, there's, there'll be some slides, there'll be some discussion as we go through, hopefully. And my sort of the general idea of my presentation is to introduce uh, visual anthropology as as a discipline in itself to uh, to language documentation and see sort of what we can do and how uh, visual anthropology as a field can aid in uh, language documentation. So uh, my presentation focuses on minority languages as a tool of resistance, especially in, in Jersey. Um, the film that I'll be showing shortly follows William Renouf, uh, who's my grandfather, and uh, he was four at the outbreak of the Second World War. Um, it follows his tale of Jersey under occupation and recounts his memory and the way that Gerio is used as both a tool of resistance and as a tool to recount certain memories. The film itself is in English, there's, bits, there's a bit of Jerry in it, discusses uh, Jerry mostly. My work that I'm, that I'm carrying on with this year is a film that will be filmed uh, entirely in Jerry. Um, I think I'm trying to understand different things as I'm going along through my research, and definitely I try and blur the lines between sort of anthropology, language documentation, psychogeography, uh, art, and various different disciplines to really like, try and contextualize um, language documentation inside sort of a bigger whole that has definitely political and, and cultural influences. Both politics with a big P and a small P definitely. As I'll show you in a sec, sort of the, the official uh, Jersey line on preserving uh, Gerier isn't necessarily, um, necessar doesn't necessarily take into account the, uh, the political importance of it. And it's very much so sort of a, a task in um, in very basic uh, tick box cultural preservation. Um, so hopefully I'm entering a debate inside language documentation and inside visual anthropology, definitely a reflexivity and hopefully I can, I can talk about, about that a bit, a bit later as well. Um, so started with a, with a quote there, um, where there is power there is resistance. Um, it's a good writer, Michel Foucault. So a bit like Jersey, uh, it's an island, as you can see there, really, really small, uh, situated in the English Channel. It makes up one of the Channel Islands, so the three sort of biggest ones, uh, maybe include four, are Jersey, Guernsey, Alderney and Sark, and as well as that there's Herm, Jetu, Liu, Breku, Beru and the Minkies. Um, some of the islands aren't inhabited by like real people, they're inhabited by multi-billionaires who just sort of stay there for, for tax loopholes. Um, probably you'll know, um, you'll know Jersey, you'll heard of Jersey, because in 2016 the Panama Papers were released and they implicated world leaders and celebrities in 11,000 cases of tax avoidance. Uh, it's, Jersey's been targeted as a place that has been found to be holding money, including a uh, good friend David Cameron's money. He doesn't know how it got there. Um, so, I think sort of the, 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 the landscape of, of the front of Jersey, if you come in on the boat, if anyone's ever been there and wants to go, um, you'll sort of see these big sort of pieces of, of finance spectacle um, on, the, on the shorefront, these big glass HSBC buildings and stuff. Um, and really, it really like, seems to be like a pinnacle of, of uh, 
sort of capitalist globalization. Um, and this is yeah, this is the this is the image that many people have of the Channel Islands. You know, people drinking uh, drinking champagne on yachts, and, and definitely some darker times. Some some dark headlines have come out at Jersey, not just uh, about tax avoidance, but about you know awful historical abuse and, and different things like that. It's definitely been an island that's been shrouded in secrecy uh, over the years. Um, but I guess what I what guess what I'm here to do really is whilst I think all of that is is dreadful and I, I do a lot to try to try and fight fight that, not just as an image of Jersey, but in general we need to highlight the problems. I try and um, sort of subvert the narrative of, of that big finance finance uh, spectacle in my work. Um, <clears throat> so yeah. So yeah, um, so if I talk about the, uh, the occupation, so Jersey was under Nazi occupation between 1940 and uh, 1945. It was the, uh, the only place in the British Isles that, that was occupied. Um, and I mean, the occupation was the, was the uh, stopped, a lot, like, stopped a lot of things coming in and out of Jersey. And that's sort of the, the area and the time that I'm gonna try, try and talk about and see how that's affected uh, sort of the historical makeup and definitely the discourse of Jersey uh, and Jersey culture and language preservation in general. Um, so yeah, uh, Jerry, it's a language in which Jersey people, as we better Jersey people have exchanged poetry, stories, scandals, beliefs and business. It's a language of lullabies and laughs, satire and swear words and so much Jersey history is recorded only in Jerry. Is a living language, and we look forward to passing it on to generations to come. Um, I think it's important to note as well that Jerry is is not the uh, the official language of Jersey, and the laws uh, are not written in Jerry; they're written in in legal French. Um, and definitely, Jerry has a connotation with with sort of the the, the working class. And my grandfather's always uh, talks about how. He speaks Jerry and he speaks good French. And that's really that's really interesting how he mentions the, the word good French and that was that was what he was meant to talk and sort of the proper way, the proper way of talking, especially in schools. Um, so here is the uh, Jersey government uh, website, and this is the bit about about Jerry, about Jersey traditional language. Um, so in 2001, there were 2,874 people who spoke Jerry. Um, now, we think there's about 1%, so that's about probably about 1,000 people. Although I, I'm not sure, I'd say it could be a bit less than that. I'm not totally sure. And it's definitely a very, uh, a very sort of aging population to speak it. So literally, as the days go forward, there are less and less people um, who are able to speak it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's Jerry Educational School, which I went through, um, and it's optional from the age of, I think I started with about six, about six years old. Um, and I guess sort of what I was talking, I guess, guess sort of the, the idea that I'm trying to bring to forward of this is sort of the way that the government in Jersey is, is portraying Jerry is this sort of like, although they do say, um, well, they, they say that they say, they say a few things about about Jerry. They don't understand it in its in its entirety of its its cultural and uh, political importance. And I think even if we're not physically learning the language, then I think we really need to start uh, learning why it's politically important and why it's politically important to so many so many other um, ways that people are resisting in the world right now. Um, so Lofus de Jerry is the uh, sort of the, the centre that the lessons uh, take place from. So, and um, this is their website, and they've got uh, three teachers. I think there's going to be. I think they're looking for another one at the moment because again, they're these. They're getting a bit older and retiring. Um, the sort of stuff they have on their website is is really cool. There's some. Um, there's sort of some recordings. Let's see where it is. I'll play, one, play a bit of one of them now. There's some recordings of, uh, of Jerry, but it's like a very stand on, this is how Jerry is spoken. Here's a face of someone speaking Jerry with very little context uh, surrounding it. So I'll play a bit of one now. Mm -hmm. 
That's Gary. He's one of the uh, one of the Jerry teachers at the moment. Um, the work they do is really important. Uh, they're pretty they're pretty underfunded. And I guess what I'm trying to do instead of instead of critique their work at all, because yeah, again, I think it's really important is build on it and contextualise it. I think that's the most important thing. Um, so I made a film uh, last year for my second year uh, BA project, which I'm continuing this year. So I'm basically here to show you. Uh, my film, my work, and I'm going to talk about the politics of it afterwards, and then I'm going to show you sort of the introduction to, to the continuation that I'm doing this year. So yeah, I'm good. Uh, so there you go. Uh, that's that's Gary. He's one of the uh, one of the Jerry teachers at the moment. Um, the work they do is really important. Uh, they're pretty they're pretty underfunded. And I guess what I'm trying to do instead of instead of critique their work at all, because yeah, again, I think it's really important is build on it and contextualise it. I think that's the most important thing. Um, so I made a film uh, last year for my second year uh, BA project, which I'm continuing this year. So I'm basically here to show you uh, my film, my work, and I'm going to talk about the politics of it afterwards, and then I'm going to show you sort of the introduction to to the continuation that I'm doing this year. So yeah, I'm good. Uh. One minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday, the 8th of May. But in the interest of saving lives, the ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded all along the front. And uh, our dear Channel Islands are also to be free today. opposition by telling them stories of uh, underweight uh, results of their farming or hiding pigs or hiding cattle that weren't registered to be killed and fed to to the household plus friends and neighbours and uh, is it a good tool? I don't personally think so, but uh, it's a dying tool. Usually uh, it is not going to be going for much longer. It will still be with a bit of a farming community, but uh, you know, with young people and and ordinary people no. Um, not many you now are speaking Jersey French. So where about two going? Now we're going to normal now. Okay. So what what's important about normal? The, the German fortifications which are still there. Over that way, 
about 35 miles uh, is the coast of France. It's um, St. Marlow. Um, and that's where the, the main port that furnished and that they supplied the Germans over here during the war, till Somalia was taken. And then they, they were stuck. And well, as you can see, there's pillboxes boxes all around. Yeah. They were, it was heavily defended. Yeah. But there was gun emplacements like this all around the island. Yeah. There was one, um, quite close to where we were, we lived, we lived, and there was one of some Martins that I know of, but there were some everywhere. I was wondering if you could tell me what sort of uh, punishments were, were given to people that, that were found to be resisting the occupation in the island, in different ways that people did resist it. In other words, I went into a barrel to get out of it because they were shooting, and the young man told me, go in the barrel. So I did, but there was no bottom in the barrel. So I went in one, okay, I think I had to stop. The, um, this stone was laid in, in, to commemorate with the cross ship that came in from Sweden to bring us uh, Red Cross parcels. There is never has any ship in this port been so welcome. Well that being is for people a victory and um I realised it being cut out, you know, so I thought it was just being painted. So, so who, who were the people that made the, uh, the, the beaver around the island? Who, who brought the beaver in? Yeah, who put, who put the beaver around the island? Um, so the beaver, uh, beaver for victory, right? Beaver for victory, yeah. And the beaver was, um, there's also one in the Robert Square, which was done by stonemasons as they were doing the square out. They did it underneath the German's nose. Wow. And uh, there, it's one of those things. Christmas of 1944, whilst we were sitting down to, okay, uh, no um, big thing, uh, uh, big meals, but we were better off than uh, the Germans who, well in fact there was one German officer trying to get um, Swedes out of frozen ground whilst we were sitting to our, our Christmas lunch of 
roast chicken, more than likely, uh, potatoes, the odd cabbage that we grow, and vegetables, and apple pies to finish. We had enough flour to make the, um, the pie up. We had, okay, we were, we were controlled. We had to supply so much to German authorities of wheat, of livestock. If we had too many cattle, we had to give one up. We'd be sent to the pigs that were, re were registered. Uh, one, some had to go to the German troops. But uh, there was a lot on the farms that weren't registered and how they got killed and hung and quartered and hidden is, is quite a story. In fact, some, one, some German, because Germans used to come in and, and search, and um, someone had uh, half a pig in a bed with, the other, with grandma. And grandma was very sick, she couldn't get out of the bed, but the pork was there. And save for future. Um, basically, Let's forget the occupation. It's uh, it's a long time past, and it's it won't be forgotten. Not by people that were living here. It won't be forgotten by the, maybe the younger generation, because. Uh, they were, they, or probably even their parents weren't involved. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, that was uh, my project that I did uh, last year. And like I said before, my idea was basically to, uh, to contextualize this sort of, this, this, uh, this idea of, of recording, recording languages. You can see there's very little uh, Gerie actually spoken in the piece, but I still think it's, it's an important piece, a piece of documentation to document why, why this is important. You know, it's, it's documentation, it's anthropology, and uh, it's activism. Um, something that I think I missed out earlier was, um, I guess, something that I, I will be working on uh, during my during my uh, my f my further work is um, trying to maybe undo the the homogenisation of of the language. So in 1972, uh, uh, Frank Lemaitre uh, he compiled the uh, English Jarier Dictionary, and that's being updated in the future. But it's uh, it's homogenised the language into sort of into sort of one, and that's not the case. My my grandmother lived um, about three miles away from my grandfather, and sometimes their language was so different that it couldn't be comparable. Um, and there's I think there's roughly I think it usually it usually changes the language changes significantly every sort of 360 yards to a mile. Um, because it was it was very much so based on farms or, or community of farms. So my grandma, who was in St. Balaj, for the word spider, she said Ironye. And my grandfather, who was in St. Martin's, which is sort of the other side of the island, said Spid. And it was just that differentiation of, of languages. And I guess that's sort of, again, what I'm trying to, uh, trying to break. 
So talking about uh, visual anthropology more, more now, <coughs> um, I think when talking about, about visual anthropology, it's such, it's such a big and contested subject of, of refle reflexivity, representation, the sensorial turn that's happening at the moment, um, and definitely sort of the effects of postmodernism on the discipline in general. Um, so I had a few issues with, with making a film as, as to all, as to all uh, anthropologists and to all filmmakers. So obviously my, issue with, my, my first issue was time. Um, I was a second year student, I'm only a third, third year student now, and sort of the time and the format that I was allowed to put this in or that I could put this in was definitely limiting to say what I, what I wanted to say. Um, as you can see, it's pretty shaky, and that's due to uh, EasyJet's ridiculous prices for taking more luggage home. Um, so yeah, that, that was that was obviously an issue. I didn't have a tripod with me. I just had I just had my camera. Um, so and I guess the massive the massive thing that I think we need to always think about is the camera's effect and the physical power relation that the camera can bring to any situation. Um, so obviously that's my grandfather, who I, I know very well. Um, but he still talks very differently as soon, you know, as soon as I put that camera in between us. He talks differently. Um, as well, he's, he's from an older generation as well, but maybe isn't used to, to uh, you know, everyone, everyone now is continuously taking videos, continuously taking photographs, continuously sharing them, uploading them. And he's not really used to that. You know, like having a camera out when he was younger was for a special occasion. And having a camera out now, it's very much so, um, he's like oh oh I don't know what to do sometimes and he told me as well because I, I went back to him I was like I really want to continue this project and continue working with you for my third year for my dissertation and hopefully beyond um, and he was like I, I'm not sure if I want to because I don't speak very good Jerry and that was that was some sort of that was uh, it was a bit upsetting actually to hear him say that to think that I had to create this sort of perfect documented um, academic piece that didn't have much reflexivity uh, in it because what I want to show as well as well as as a document is a, something really personal to me like a reflexive document of my relationship with my grandfather and my relationship and his relationship with this language that is dying out um, So yeah, and I think, I think another issue I, I, I have as well is I tried to sit down with him and basically say, how, how should we edit this? Because I don't want this to be my, just my artifact, uh, my piece. I want this to be a piece where we both can say something. Um, and my lecturer always says that filming is about buying the ingredients. And when you edit, it's cooking the ingredients and making something. Um, and I, he, he was maybe a bit reluctant sometimes to... For, for that sort of uh, end product. Um, and I think maybe, you know, if I had more of his input, um, and there's no fault, no fault of, of either of us really, if I had more of his input and we could have edited together, then I think maybe we could have come up with a really different, a different constructive product, um, which I think we really need to think about in both sort of visual anthropology and language, language documentation, is we are, create, we are going on, art, on an artistic endeavor. We are creating something, we are creating a film, we are creating a piece of art. Um, and it is only a reflection of, of our own thoughts and creativity of this process. Um, and yeah, I guess, you know, anthropology traditionally makes the, makes the unfamiliar seem, seem familiar. And I guess sort of what I was trying to do in this work is sort of flip that narrative and make for me the familiar seem unfamiliar and put it in this product and put it inside, I had 10 to 15 minutes, this film, put it inside 10 minutes. And you know, that's, that's really difficult. And I find that really difficult this year as well, my, my time constraints and, and how I'm able to set it out, just containing it inside this one product. And that's something we've got to be really careful of um, with visual anthropology and you know, with language documentation and with various things that use that, that technology. Um, is we're not just filming this in this passive encounter. We are creating something, and we are creating uh, a power dynamic in it. So I guess the last thing as well is sort of the anthropolo anthropologist as activist uh, sort of dialogue, and that's been around in anthropology for a long time. Um, 
and it's sort of like, at what point do I do I stop being a passive narrator and a passive onlooker? And what point do I start getting involved with activism? Um, and I think when it comes to Gerrier, I have been have been involved with, with sort of activism in Gerrier. As I got older, um, and at school, especially being involved in it, you can get you can get a bit ridiculed for being involved with this with this sort of thing. It's seen as you know just for old people, and I guess. Yeah, I have been involved in like, activism and the uh, and the documentation of Jerry. I worked as a transcriber um, when I left school for three months, transcribing uh, Jerry literature into a computer system. And I guess I really wanted to continue that through um, the anthropological lens. So now, now I'm going to talk a bit more about sort of uh, resistance in Jerry and re like resistance in Jersey and other types of resistance that took place during the, the Nazi occupation, exactly what they, what they were, were resisting. Um, so here is a bunker, um, and these are all around the island in this picture here. Uh, so the bunker that I was filming, my film, is here. One, one of these, so I can't really turn the picture, one of these two. Um, and these are all around, all around sort of the outside, outside of the island. Um, and they were looking out to, to stop people, people coming in. These sort of massive, uh, sort of stoic structures of, of power, I think have really, really affected, really affected people living on the island. And I think there's something really can be said for like the study of uh, psychogeography. Um, And I think they serve as a memory of the fact that power is everywhere. In, like, as going back to before, definitely in a Foucauldian sense. Um, but these structures can seem somewhat, somewhat unimportant under his analysis. Um, so I guess it started making me think about what would happen if the structures were in the middle and looking outwards. Um, and Foucault understands the idea of a panopticon, which is uh, a prison popularized by Bentham. And it has, it's a circular prison and it has a central watchtower and from there the warden can look into uh, different cells that lit up and the effect of that is that uh, in each cell the prisoners they start to self-govern and Foucault said that that is stretching to every every part of a society and people have become uh, sort of self-governing and um, it, go, it goes from a compact mass um, to a collection of separated individuals. So that sort of started making me thinking, and you know, he says that all these, all these, uh, all these things going to the school, into the clinic, into the museum, all these def different institutions, there are these power structures that are, that are really apparent. And my grandfather, when he was at school, he spoke French, and French was language at school, and that power structure, again, was, was very apparent. And his idea of speaking good French compared to speaking Gerrier, I think is definitely the effect of, of this power. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's really important that we, that again, that we view, especially for my work, we're viewing Gerrier in, as that form of resistance and as that form of rebuilding uh, a loads of atomized, atomized individuals and definitely a sense of community and there is a sense of community who uh, are people who speak Jerry. Uh, my grandfather and his friends go like once a month um, to lunch together, and they all speak Jerry together. And there's that that sense of community and that sense of building. And through this language, and it is just a, like a language exchange, there is that sense of community and that that, that political discourse. Um, Again, again, Jerry was was uh, forms definitely working class solidarity, and um, and it created it ended up creating a divide from the monopoly of power. You know, when the Nazis uh, were, were on the island, they couldn't understand Jerry, and that creates a divide of those who can understand it and who can't understand it. It very much provided a space of political resistance, um, and definitely, definitely, political resistance did take place. Uh, through linguistics as a form of subversion um, to sort of the the uh, homogenous idea of, of of fascism as an ideology. So it's it's 
it, beca it became something that was inherently uh, anti-fascist. Um, but that's not, again, that's not the only sort of resistance that, that did take place uh, on the island. And I think that's really important when we're discussing Jerry to put it into a bigger makeup. So um, this is uh, the Skisa by uh, an artist called Claude Cahun. And um, she's, she's, she was an artist who formed part of the resistance on the island um, and was uh, probably one of the first openly transgender artists um, starting her work in the 1920s. Um, the importance of her work, again similar to Jerry, was this, was this subversion of Nazi tactics and her and uh, her girlfriend would uh, put little notes in Nazis' cars um, and make, continuously make pamphlets um, and make pictures of sort of gender and, uh, and sexuality subversion and place them in Nazis' cars and a lot of, this, a lot of the time the Nazis end up blaming each other and fights would break out. Um, she was herself uh, French. I'm, I'm not sure there's no record particularly of whether, of whether she, she spoke Gerry, but again, like I'm saying, it, it all makes that build up of, of resistance on the island. And I think definitely it's something that should be covered in, uh, in schools and in sort of the, the Gerry curriculum. Cover this, this uh, intersection of resistance between language and art and psychogeography and politics, like I was talking about before. Um, so, so today, uh, Jerry, I'm not going to talk too much about Badlebeck because you've got uh, Kit Ashton who's going to be who's going to be coming to, to give a talk. Uh, I think in May, uh, yeah. April, May sort of time. Um, so Kit's a member of the band Badlebeck, which was the music that was playing at the end of my video. Um, he's a, yeah, he's a, he's a good friend of mine and, uh, and an activist for Jerry, he's studying a PhD in ethnomusicology at Goldsmiths as well. Um, and definitely Jerry is playing a really important part in popular culture at the moment uh, in, in Jersey. And I think that idea, that which I think it's definitely trying to be like popularised, but not in it's crazily fresh and not something just, just regurgitated. Um, and I know that as well as uh, sort of this, this activism of, uh, in, in popular culture in Jersey, what we're finding as well is that um, the narrative of, the, of Jerry can often, you know, the narrative of any language can often be tied to nationalism. But it's most definitely the politicians that are, that are uh, on the left that are adopting this, these ideas of, of uh, popular culture in Jerry is Montfort Tadier, he's also a member of the band, he's part of the Party Corps Reform Jersey, which are, which are uh, on the left. And I guess that's sort of the, the importance of, of learning it and definitely fighting, fighting fascism and, and making it a product of this sort of uh, progressive politics. I want to talk about a bit about uh, Liberation Day in Jersey. So Liberation Day is celebrated on the 9th of May in Jersey and the 8th of May in Guernsey. The 9th as well. Yeah, is it the 8th? The 9th. Is it the 9th as well? Okay. Um, and it's the celebration of the liberation of the Channel Islands and everyone gets uh, a day off. And Jerry plays like, a really important part in, in that celebration. Um, let's see if I can find it. Sorry, I've got the. It was, just, it was just a sound clip anyway. So like this is, uh, this is a song that's, that's sung at the, um, at the Liberation Day every year. And there's some, there's some words spoken in Jerry, 
and uh, sort of the the, Jerry, the the children that are learning Jerry at school, they take part in these celebrations and it forms like a very central part of remembering the island's liberation um, and remembering exactly uh, uh, what happened. And yeah, it's forming a really part, a really important part of, of, of the culture. And I think preserving it is, is really, really important, but not for any sort of um, nationalist agenda at all, but very much so for understanding it as a form of political resistance and understanding it uh, in its context. And I, I think, I think the, the government, uh, especially, I, I mean, I love to, I love to talk to them um, and to sort of have a com open a dialogue of the way that they regard the language and the way that they're trying to promote the language because I think we definitely need to relook at it. Um, so yeah, my future work. So I'm, yeah, I'm continuing work on this area this year and I'm going to show you my trailer for my film that I'll be completing in April. Um, and I'd, love to, I'd love to come show that film as well, that'd be great. Um, and I guess this one's a lot more about how language and memory are connected and uh, especially about how language and memory of are trapped inside um, sort of industries of times past in Jersey are trapped inside this this language, and um, how this memory can be recounted and definitely playing in sort of the politics of memory and official and unofficial narratives of memory. So this is my trailer for my latest film. Jerry is a language spoken by only 1,000 people in the small island of Jersey, situated 14 miles from the north coast of France. It is a language at the verge of extinction, spoken mostly by older generations recording the memories of Jersey in times past. As Jersey's tax haven status becomes more and more scrutinised, other industries such as agriculture are overshadowed. This ethnographic exploration of minority languages and identity will tell a story of industry and memories trapped inside Nigeria. I, I don't use Nigeria as uh, a language through, uh, every, on a daily basis, but we meet up with friends of the farming industry and Sharia is spoken, it's, if we don't want anybody to understand what we're talking about, we talk Sharia. Mind you, we still talk Sharia between us. Forever ambiguously formalised, seen as a language tied to the working class, the farmer, the fisher and the tradesman. This is a story about the effects of globalisation and capital on memory, minority languages and communication. So that's, that's my future work and I think definitely this time I'm gonna, going to be um, experimenting a lot more and definitely trying to blur the lines of a lot of different disciplines. I've been really influenced by um, the work of Sarah Pink, who's a visual anthropologist, and turned towards what's known as, as the sensorial term, and the term for understanding different, th different pieces in different senses, and understanding the world through different senses. Um, at the moment, there's a lot of work happening at Harvard, which is really, really impressive, of creating these uh, sensorial artifacts um, that are really like pushing the boundary of what visual anthropology can do. And I think really pushing the boundary of what other disciplines such as language documentation can do. Um, and it's, it's trying to connect, uh, the, the, I guess, the dots in different ways and trying to connect um, the way that we understand this, or the way that we're trying to break from this sort of scientific rationalism to create an artifact a piece of art and a film in itself and not be ashamed of that. So I think it's really important that instead of trying to document things um, sort of just head on, whilst that's important and understand people communicating, creating artifact of yourself and being reflexive and embracing things is really important um, for the future of, of visual anthropology and, and hopefully that can, that can break into different, different disciplines as well. 
So yeah, thank you very much. Is, is your grandmother still alive or not? No, she's not, unfortunately. Mm. Um, how different is GAE from the language in South Korean Guernsey? I mean, do they understand each other? Um, mm. I can, I can yeah, probably. I think uh, to a certain extent, to a certain extent they do, but it's I quite mean, different. I could understand a little bit because of French, but I don't know. Probably Julie's better yeah, to. Yes, yes. So, um, And what I didn't understand very well is, is it taught or not taught? It is taught, yeah, no, it is taught. Um, you get, when I, when I was taught it, you get like a workbook, and it's a bit sort of like, like you get in schools of French, you get a workbook of going through week by week by week. And I think uh, Julia's written, written about, uh, was, I don't know if it's in a book or an article, I've, I've read it about um, sort of the proficiency of, of young Gerrier speakers. And I mean, at school only got half an hour to an hour a week. Oh, um, exactly. And that's all. And what what happened as well? Because I I was um, an assistant teacher as well um, for a bit. And what would happen is it usually take place during assembly or or some some time in school. And they'd send kids um, who had like problems concentrating and stuff to this class, so they weren't sort of the teacher's problem anymore. So it became a lot more an issue of sort of crowd control mm -hmm. than actually getting to grips with learning a new language. And half an hour just really. Really isn't enough, but I know that uh, Garine, uh, Tony, and Colin, who all teach area, they're they're working so so hard to try and push it in schools, and they've now come up with the uh, the TG, TGJ, which is the Test of the Algeria, which is sort of like the GCSE equivalent. I was the first I was the first person to go through that in 2011, and I think they've got a few people since, and it's sort of trying to. I don't know if it's the right way to go about it, but trying to sort of uh, have it more on a par and trying to bring it up to the way that French is taught uh, in schools in Jersey. I mean, we start we start learning French at four in Jersey, sort of the way that it's taught. Um, I'm curious about uh, what does Jerry mean to the youth of Jersey? I mean, are they interested? Are they active? Um, no, no, not a lot, really. Um, not a lot. It's more, and I think that's why this is really important. I think that's why contextualizing is really important. There's a lot of people in Jersey who care about politics and who care about this sort of thing, and interest in this sort of thing as well. And I think sort of sitting through, how I'm like, I don't know if you, did you do languages at school? Yeah, sort of I like, mean, it's like, exactly, sitting through learning languages at school is a really arduous task yeah. and not very exciting. And to like actually, continue doing that uh, in the same way a lot of people a lot of people don't necessarily want to do that mm. and I think that's why it's really important we start connecting in different ways and building different bridges that we that haven't we thought about before but yeah no, I think I so I, I was the um, this is like anthology of, of Jerry poetry and I was the youngest published author there for about 40 years so like it was me and then the person <coughs> after that was about maybe 30 40 years older than me Would you say that, because obviously you talked about how Algeria was spoken mostly by the working class and how it was a language of the working class, especially like now it's mostly farmers and things like that. Would you say it's actually, a, would you say it's like a limited language in that you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't really be able to update it to speak sort of in the same way that we speak contemporary English and French? It's not really a contemporary language. Would you say that, or would you say that it yeah. can evolve in the same way? I mean, they are. They definitely like update it and are creating new words to put in the dictionary. But I think the issue was the homogenisation of the language and trying to create it into this one singular sort of entity, because it's not French and it's not English and it is very different. And even to call it one language instead of various, not only was it one language of various dialects, I say sometimes it's it's very different different types of things. And I think, um, yeah, I think trying to keep it up to date is can provide can prove quite difficult. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, if as you were saying, you're trying to sort of foreground the the differentiation between all the different types. Yeah. 
of Sherry. So how does that translate into um, it being in schools and being taught where obviously you would need presumably the, that would lean more towards the standardised model, wouldn't it? Especially if you're trying to also do kind of step, you know, graded qualifications. Yeah, no, no, of course, of course. How, how do those two things fit together? I think as far as Jerry is, Jerry teaching, you know, if, if we had unlimited time and limited resources, I think teaching different types and understanding different types would be really amazing, but it's not idealistic and we don't. And I think, you know, I think what Frank Ramage, who made the dictionary, and what his, his son Francois continue to do for Jerry is really, really, really important. And it was at a time um, that it was needed, you know, that, that Jerry was this really important thing, really important politically. And to get it out there in a way that, that people could, could digest was really important. I think we should continue that. But I also think we need to understand it as different different things to put it in a political context. And I guess that's more what I was what I was trying to say. I think they should carry on teaching it absolutely, but I think there should be an addition to it. It sounds to me like you're a relatively unusual case as a sort of younger person who's taken the learning of Jerry quite far and quite seriously. Yeah. Uh, obviously you've worked with people who are trying to revive it and stuff uh, and you want to be optimistic, but in a sort of very realistic sense. How optimistic are you about the chances of sort of revitalising and arresting that decline? Realistically, probably not very. Yeah. But that's why I think that's why again I'm saying that the things like this are, are important because even if we don't um, revitalise the physical language and speaking of the language, if we can revitalise its importance in a political context, then I think that's really important. Um, and I know that you know school children. I mean, I have I I stopped learning it at school when I was 17, so that was uh, like five five years ago. And I've been in London for four years now, so I'm pretty out of touch with exactly what they're doing, what they're doing at the moment. Um, and I think I'd, I'd love to love to see what they're doing. I don't know if they've had if they had an increased uptake. Do you know? No. No. I can tell you. Uh, I may see your talk, but I can I can I. Can, I information about that I can, can yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. They, they have actually recruited two more teachers but the the uptake has gone down significantly because they they started what they call Pio, the the uh, uh, talking places which are basically centers of excellence for teaching GRA but the problem is that it's straight after school and and the kids can't get to other schools to do it um, their parents are at work so yeah <laughs> It's been a bit disastrous. You, yeah, you find there's like a really, really steep decline into secondary school as well. So you'll have maybe a class of, I think in my primary school, there was maybe 10 of us, 10, 12 of us learning it. And when I got to secondary school, there was a sharp decline into, I think, three of us. And I guess there was like a, there's a massive issue as well that when I was sort of 16, I was in the same class as someone who's 12 and of a different level to me because they don't have the resources to continue to be teaching. So I'd be like working in my booklet while someone else working in a booklet. And you know, as much as, as much as, uh, you know, I was, as much as they really, 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 really tried to, um, it becomes difficult. And I think, I definitely think that the three, three teachers that I knew, like absolutely amazing what they do. And I, I can't I commend them enough for what they do. And I think they find it difficult and really frustrating the constraints that they have. Did your parents speak it? My parent, um, my mum. Again, I'm not I'm not totally sure because it's never like my granddad when he speaks it because it's never because to him it was never like an official language. He slips between French, Jerry, and English, and he very much just slips in and out of all of them. My mum slips in and out of in and out of a lot of them, and. I wouldn't say it, she's not, she's not to the level my granddad can, and definitely can't speak it fluently, but she, she we use phrases, and um, we use different things in the house, that, like will be in Jerry. Uh, I think my uncles, um, my uncle can maybe speak it a bit more. Um, but yeah, it's because it's never, because it's not as formalised, it's difficult to really, to really tell, like, a fluency level, unless you're going to, by like, the official dictionary. 
sort of level, difficult to, under, to tell the fluency of it. Um, in terms of discrepancies that you describe between like dialects with the spot, like you gave the example of the spider, um, are there lots of different sort of um, are there concepts like are there discrepancies within concepts you can describe in Jerry and then also concepts you can describe in Jerry but not English or for example in English? And do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I mean, this. There's like different sayings, so like my granddad when he's angry, he was like piss le porne, which is like there's a feel full of parsnips, which makes absolutely no sense. But it's sort of that like it sort of rolls off the tongue and sounds quite nice. There's definitely like discrepancies um, of different terms and different concepts. Um, my my level of Jerry is influent and it wouldn't be it wouldn't be enough. I wouldn't know enough to be able to tell you like a really, really clear, distinctive answer, but there are definitely yeah, discrepancies. Um, if you say it's like sort of slowly dying out and less people speaking it, how relevant is Jerry A for national pride or nationalism like today? How relevant is it for nationalism? Yeah. Um, I think ironically the sort of like the 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 it depends what it depends what what way you understand national like how you understand nationalism. I think for sort of like the the nationalism in jazz, there was, a, there was like a a uh, a phrase like there's another boat in the morning. Like if you don't like it, lump it, which is like really 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 awful. And I think in terms of that type of nationalism, there's very much so. Oh yeah, we love Jerier with from that side of the camp. Nothing really being done to to sort of revitalise it. It's actually the more sort of progressive side that are doing the work to revitalise it. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, quite, it's quite difficult to really, to really tell. And I think we need to be really, really, really careful of how we go about, like go about, uh, about the, revitalization of it um, but we don't want to be exclusionary in any way and we want it to be like something that everyone can be included in, everyone can enjoy and not this sort of national tre treasure in like a really bad sense. Okay. In the kind of area. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's it's got like different uh, different like linguistic branches. Um, its full name in English is Jersey Norman French, and uh, it's closely related to uh, Genesier and other Channel Island languages. Um, and yeah, it's it's sort of. Whilst obviously you can hear the similarities, similarities to French, um, it's very much sort of coming to like a lot of people from a lot of people who have like Jersey surnames. I don't really like saying that, but uh, yeah, it, it, a lot of that, a lot of the time, it was to do with sort of Scandinavian uh, people, like the Vikings coming to uh, colonise Normandy, and then Jersey being part of that. So there's definitely like different sort of roots of of Jerry as a language. Um, and because it's because it's not as because it's not really comparable in like it's official to something like English, it's difficult to say that there are there are English words, there are French words, there are Jerry in and of itself words. Um, but yeah it's it's sort of like a t type of norm. So some, some of the words people think are English in Jerry actually come from Norman because the Normans invaded England in 1066 and a lot of English is, comes from Norman. Um, people often think it's like a mixture of French and English and actually it's not. Those words are a lot older. Yeah. yeah. Um, also my, my granddad always tells me a story. So um, he employed uh, Portuguese workers to work on his farm. 
Um, and the actual similarities that he found between Portuguese and Sherry was quite surprising. Some words are identical, so like Kazakh, which is coat, yes. is a word that is completely identical. And you'll find as well that sort of um, a lot of, in a lot of classes uh, for adult learning in Sherry, you'll find um, a lot of, of, of uh, Portuguese uh, and Polish and Eastern European learners in the class compared to sort of this, the people who like, the sort of the anti-immigrant nationalists who claim to love Jerry won't actually go to these classes. Um, so you'll find that you'll find that a lot in the classes. Do any of the tax exiles learn it at all? No, I don't think so. Um, because like our laws, our laws are French, um, and our laws aren't in Jerry. Um, but yeah, I mean, Guernsey has its own language, and you know, Isle of Man has its own language. So, yeah. And actually, our, our uh, English as a language came mostly through trade through Canada, rather you know, we have close proximity to England. There's actually trade through Canada, mostly, that brought English to the island rather than England itself. Is um, schooling in English or in French? English, yeah. I'm not actually sure if so the school is in English, our laws are in French, and not many people speak French. And I'm not sure if, or like, on statistics, if we counted what we're counted as as a nation for English speaking or French speaking, I'm not sure statistically what we'd be what we counted as. Do you know, do you know Julia, would it be English or French speaking? Both. Um, both? Could it be both? Yeah, yeah. What, 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 yeah, what, what you look at, yes. But uh, if you want to be a lawyer in Jersey, you have to pass French test as well. Mm. There are also people who've done studies with the English of the Channel Islands because they, it's both the contact variety and, and also, yeah, it, yeah, it's interesting that that's a Canadian link. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm very interested in, in this issue of, of homogenization versus, if you like, dialectal richness. Yeah. Um, I, I can talk to you about that one if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm, some, some people, I'm, I'm, I've actually been in Jersey uh, this month because I'm, I'm, I'm involved in a, in a separate project, which I'm hoping you might perhaps become involved in. I love you. Um, which actually, as part of the ACE aims, is, is to document the, the, the regional richness because we're very aware that that's disappearing very, very fast. Even of the few people, and some people recognize as few as 100 fluent speakers now. Um, um, mo many of them come from the one area, which is, is in the west of one of the countrified areas, which is the one the dictionary is based on. So, and so we know that some of the regional dialects that our speakers have, have died, some of them fairly recently, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, my, my grandfather's dialect, uh, Samata, which is on the, in the east of the island, um, he, he took me for a drive down, down the road and you could probably point to maybe 10 farms that had that dialect, um, which, is, which is quite interesting. There's definitely like, a, so the, the island's got up to 12 parishes and roughly speaking, People think of it like a dialect parish, but it is way more than that. You know, some some parishes could have two or three different variants inside it, and it's only nine miles long by five miles wide as well. So it's very very small. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in the dialectal richness because I'm certain words um, and that's an east-west difference and it's the other way around in Guernsey um, <laughs> um, but there's also much more interesting stuff that you find once you start doing you know, listening to how people speak from different areas and, and yeah it's, it's kind of it's interesting iconic versus kind of actual um, and there's other people there's other myths about language we can call folk linguistics that then you start to find kind of even more much more interesting stuff behind that I think, I think that's where anthropology is uh, 
role fits into this this research and this debate in general because I think anthropology itself is the study of things that aren't necessarily like official or the study of taboos or, or whatever and I think that's where we can sort of lend, lend a hand especially with this this like multiple multiple archive archive project is definitely lend a hand theoretically for anthropology and physically from from visual anthropology um, to definitely understand these different dif differentiations and understand them politically as well. It's really, really important. Um, I just wanted to ask how you, because at, at the beginning you were talking about um, images of um, glass and capitalist globalisation in Jersey. Um, and I was just wondering how you think the globalisation will play, or how Jerry will play in with globalisation, how those two will mesh together and what the effect they'll have on each other. Yeah. Um, again, like, I guess the sort of the way in what my work's going on now uh, is is that effect. And I, I, I think like, I reiterate all the time. So I think we do need to remember it's so important that what I'm talking about more is the is the flow of capital when it comes to globalization, and not the flow of people, because a lot of the time, yeah, the flow, the idea of the flow of people and that affecting Jerry is what is what people get hung up on. I, I don't think that's right. I think that's playing into really, really dangerous dialogues. Um, and I think the idea about the flow of capital and the, like, the big financial capital, uh, spectacle and the big financial uh, financialization of the island and the loss of the agricultural industry does play a really, really big part uh, in sort of the, the loss of Jerry. You know, Jersey's becoming more and more and more um, it's still not very, it's going more and more like fast paced, fast paced um, and more and more about, about finance. Um, yeah. um, do Sherry Edwards survive in like nouns, for example, in everyday English parlance? For example, in particular domains like farming, or um, other words, like yeah, so I mean, like kind of technical. I mean, I didn't really realise this, but the term virgin, I don't know if that's a term that's used. It's a quarter of an acre. Is that? I don't know if that's used in English. Um, so it's like my granddad always talked about things in virgins, which I thought was an English word for ages, and apparently he told me that, like last maybe four weeks ago that was actually wasn't an English word. And that in farming uh, they do talk about about vergees as like measurements of 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 in, of, um, of of farming. And and yeah, I think a lot of it's in French though, because obviously the laws are in French. When they're talking about stuff like partitions and stuff, a lot of the time that would be that would be more in French. But I don't really know particular like Jerry words. They're definitely like Jersey slang words that aren't Jerry that, that are used. Okay. But not not Jerry as such. I think. Do you use the word dwee or dwit? Not that I've heard, no. Okay, so in Guernsey it's a word for a watercourse or stream and that's definitely part of the local English yeah. that no one else would understand. Yeah. yeah not but I'm not I'm not aware of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, again, I could just not know because something, something like measuring land is not something I really talked to anyone about. So I, I, I had no idea that it, was not an, that it wasn't an English word. Um, Have you found families that speak to me at home? I mean, with children? Not really. Uh, no, because a lot of the time, you know, people people in my generation are now uh, having children. So it would be the great grandparents that would be the Jerry speakers, not even the grandparents. Um, so there is that like massive, massive disconnect um, between those, that like generational gap. I know a few years ago, uh, Tony mentioned to me there was something about a child that was speaking Jerry at home. But again, I left the island when I was 18. I haven't really 
like kept kept in, in touch. I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if that is the case. Do you know if that's the case? Does a child be brought up by younger? Yeah, I don't know. It wasn't mentioned when I was last there, but maybe it's one of these myths. That you hear. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I, again, this is before the child was born, and basically Tony had this conversation about the child being brought up bilingually. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know if that's that's happened. So. It's one in Guernsey. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm. When I when I was about seventeen, I was. I mean, I wouldn't even describe myself as a speaker because I'm not fluent. But yeah, because I was the youngest person published, youngest person that could understand Jerry mm -hmm. that I that I knew. Um, conversation in less formal surroundings. Um, um, we'll also be going to have a meal later if anyone would like to join us. So, part of the evening, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Great, this is such a good turnout.